Hello friends, you know that the three genres of Athenian drama, tragedy, comedy and satyr play shared the same festival space and time. As different modalities of drama, however, the different genres remained aesthetically and thematically distinct. Indeed, the crafts of tragedy and comedy have always been regarded as stark opposites. The suicide of Ajax, for example, could not possibly be represented on the comic stage. Similarly, one cannot imagine a tragedy involving obscenity or ad hominem lampoons of contemporary personages. It stands to reason that satyr play too should have its own unique poetic domain. But how might we specify the boundaries that set it apart from those of tragedy and especially comedy? How to tease apart the properties of comic revelry and satyr play. The ancient Athenians had begun to question how nature worked, how society should work and what was man's role in the scheme of things. How should one behave? How can one accept the injustices of life? What is the price of hubris? Tragedy was the poet's answer to some of these questions. On the other hand, within the theatre, the comic was the province of comedy, which belonged to the theatrical context of a festival and employed a whole range of tones, equal use of contemporary reality, especially politics, and it caricatured living figures. Comedy undercut theatrical illusion and played with various levels of fiction. The poetics and the place of the third genre, the satyr play, in the festival context have been more elusive and controversial. Dear friends, satiric drama as far as we know never parodies tragedy and its principal characters such as Odysseus maintain their epic stature without any caricature or burlesque. It does not contain any political allusions. Analysis reveals a kinship in sophistication and technique between the theatrical medium employed in tragedy and comedy. No one would think of writing a tragedy that is playful. Otherwise, he would be writing a satyr play. However, there is a curious asymmetry. Both satyr play and comedy have an intertextual relationship with tragedy, which comedy and satyr play do not share with each other. A satyr play such as the Cyclops, for example, may make explicit reference to tragedy. Aristophanes too engages tragedy freely. Interestingly, tragedy learned to reciprocate and here is the asymmetry. Despite a superficial kinship, old comedy and satyr play avoid each other. Nay, comedy appears as a rule to ignore the very existence of satyrs and satyr play. Tragedy has extensive ties with both. I repeat, comedy engages tragedy but appears to ignore satyr play systematically. Let us try to see if it is actually so or is it only an illusion. The explicit intertextual relationship between comedy and tragedy is well known. Satyr play has also been included in the equation at least as far as tragedy is concerned. 
The problem is that comedy and satire play do not seem to know each other, despite their having a great deal in common, at least on the surface. Still, comedy definitely invokes the primordial world of satire plays. Before considering the satiric aspects of Aristophanes, it is important to inspect the apparent firewall in the realm of poetics and intertextuality, which separates comedy and satire play. If the general existence of such a barrier can be demonstrated, what might be the comic theatrical value of an exceptional breach, such as the scene in Peace, where Aristophanes does in fact engage satyr play. Aristophanes presents an exception to the apparent rule that old comedy did not engage satyr play as a genre, text or performance. Let us look at the hauling scene in peace involving the birth by extraction of the goddess Irene. When Trigaios finally beholds Irene in all her splendor, he praises her beauty and fragrance. He notes that, among other things, she is redolent of Sophocles' song. The name of Sophocles has prompted the suggestion that this Aristophanic scene is a reenactment of a striking scene in the satyr play. Pandora or Spherocopoi or mallet wielders of Sophocles. The birth or extraction staged in the satyr play seems to have been remarkable enough not only to inspire contemporary vase paintings but also to be used by the genius of Aristophanes. Comedy needs to invoke the primordial world of satyr play and that is uniquely relevant to heuristic scene of peace. The two genres located at opposite ends of a political, cultural polarity uniquely cooperate in peace. So dear students, in addressing the notion of the boundaries defining Athenian comedy, its two siblings, tragedy and satyr play, need to be taken into consideration. The boundary between comedy and the elusive satyr play is very vague. Those who have spent some time with Greek drama sense that the boundary is more real and profound than might be quickly accounted for by obvious formal differences. But how might we clarify its outlines or at least locate it indirectly? The crosstalk between comedy and the satyr play is absent. Can we say anything about the boundary between them in terms of the relationship of each to tragedy? First of all, tragedy has been argued to stand in historical and genealogical relationship with satyr play. However, this relationship remained rather static. Comedy, on the other hand, most obviously of Aristophanes, was able to develop a mimetic and self-consciously critical relationship to tragedy. Moreover, the relationship between comedy and tragedy, as is well attested in the 11 fully extant comedies, was dynamic and ever-evolving. How can satyr play have been off-limits for Aristophanes? How is it possible for a major contemporary genre to be beyond the reach of comic intertextuality? A specific way to approach this question is to ask when and why, if ever, a comic poet violated the apparent rule to concede that satyrs are in fact good to represent. In fact, 
there has been an absence of mutual self-awareness between comedy and satyr play. Little work has been done to demonstrate explicit links between satyr play and comedy. As already noted, for all its intertextual energy, comedy does not seem eager to cooperate in establishing such a link. Where we might ask, are the satyrs in comedy? It is important to note that old comedy exhibited great variety for which Aristophanes is in no sense normative. It is only reasonable, therefore, to ask what light the fragmentary evidence for other composers of the genre might shed on our question. Cratinus, Ecphantides, Callias, Phrynicus, and Timocles all composed comedies that were titled Satyroi. There is also evidence that Eupolis used satyrs in at least one of his comedies. If we can trust a notice that says, in Eupolis, Silenoi are satyrs. Moreover, in addition to the plays that were explicitly named Satyroi, there are also a number of other dramatizations whose titles do not reflect their use of satyr choruses. Example, Dionys Alexandros by Cratinus. Besides, in Frogs, Aristophanes quotes Sphinx of Aeschylus as well as a satyr play of Achaeus of Eritrea. In the work of the comic poet Teleclides, the word Bromios refers either to a satyr or to Dionysus. The intersection, as it were, of the two terms suggests that satyrs may have been included in the playwright's dramatic concept. Diogenes Laertius cites the philosopher Menadimus to the effect that his satyr plays were inferior only to those of Aeschylus. Aristophanes also quotes him in Wasps and Frogs. Thus, we can say that other comic writers did refer to satyrs. But what seems important to Aristophanes is not satyrs or satyr play as a theatrical genre, but an original bit of invective that he admired. A more significant exception to the hypothesized absence of satyrs in comedy is the mid-5th century comic trend to represent Pericles as a morally suspect leader of satyrs. Despite his well-known courage and conservatism, or perhaps because of these qualities, Pericles is associated with the cowardly and lustful attendance of Dionysus. Plutarch opines that after the first invasion of Attica, comic choruses rail at Pericles in songs and scurrilous mockery, attacking his leadership for its cowardice and for its forfeiting of everything to the enemy. Pericles is afraid to fight and hopes to lead stupid satyrs by the force of his eloquence alone. The image of Pericles is projected as a sort of Dionysus figure and leader of satyrs. Pericles is lampooned with great plausibility by means of emphasis for bringing war on the Athenians. The coming forward of a stage figure in the person of Pericles appears to have been a sustained satire. It suggests that whole plays rather than a few lines here and there might be devoted to the criticism of various aspects of control of Athenian politics by Pericles. This testimony is more interesting because it suggests a connection without specifying it between old comedy and satyrs. The invocation of satyrs in old comedy 
is little more than a solitary allusion in Aristophanes. Friends, comedy's avoidance of intertextual contact with the satyr play is remarkable, especially because of all that the two genres might be said to have in common. Lampoon of myth, light-hearted thematics, obscenity, Dionysism and a distinct relationship with tragedy. Involvement with tragedy in fact offers one clear way to define the boundary between comedy and satyr play. Aristophanes relationship with tragedy is well known. There is extensive intertextuality, surface play and construction of contrafacts that is plays in which the plot, characters and themes of an entire tragic drama are incorporated in a comedy and metabolized by it as it were. Moreover, in his comic art, Aristophanes was intent on rivaling tragedians such as Euripides in offering solution to ills of the polis. This metafictional relationship is perhaps unique to Aristophanes and the perception of a firewall between comedy and satyr play becomes clearer. It would appear that for some reason comic drama while committed to an explicit and creative rivalry with tragedy eschews the satyr play entirely. As little as we have of Hermippus and Cratinus, for example, there is still the tenuous Periclean satirism. In all 11 extant comedies and in the fragments, we find practically nothing that alludes to satyrs. Despite its poor attestation, satyr play has been shown to engage tragedy in explicit intertextuality. The scope of this phenomenon, however, is quite narrow and at no point suggests a sustained creative rivalry between genres. The unique poetics of satyr play is closely bound up with the tragedy's place in the history of Greek theatre. Satyr play's relationship with tragedy exhibits not rivalry but a paradoxical combination of priority and posteriority. Satyr drama has been argued to represent a traditional holdover, an island of unadulterated Dionysism at a time when theatre and the theatrical festivals were rapidly evolving. Satyr play must have been more appealing and intelligible to a conservative sector of the polis at a time of precipitous change. The preeminent theatrical media of the democratic Athens, that is, tragedy and comedy, became more and more involved with contemporary politics, society, and ideology. The narratives of tragedy, in particular, were increasingly freighted with contemporary issues in unsettling and even in disturbing ways. A satyr, on the other hand, remained a satyr. As a creature of nature, he represented a bridge between God and mortal. Charged with primal Dionysiac joy, he was innocent of the psychic and social fragmentation of the polis. That is why political lampoons were manifestly not characteristics of satyr plays. Satyr drama preserved a vision of a world at the very dawn of civilization in which the satyrs participated as inventors of culture. Nietzsche opines that the satyr was something sublime and divine. Confronted with him, 
the man of culture shriveled into a mendacious caricature. The satyr chorus represented existence more truthfully, really and completely than the man of culture did. Dear students, the fundamental appeal of satyr play appears to have been an etanic nostalgia of sorts, a pre-political wholeness redolent of drama's ritual origins. If satyr drama were only an afterthought, mere comic relief from tragedy, it surely would not have survived into the 4th and 3rd centuries as a single independent performance. In a sense, the apparent assimilation of satyr drama to comedy in this later period only serves to underscore the original boundary between genres. In the relationship with satyr play and tragedy then, we observe a paradox of a chronological posteriority on the one hand, but thematic and a phenomenological priority on the other. The dual nature of satyrs fits the apparent contradiction well. They are both lewd and playful on the one hand, ancient and wise on the other. Perhaps the most tantalizing image we have of this relationship is on an inokovi in which a satyr with clear erotic intentions creeps up on a sleeping menad named Trajoidea. What is the possible outcome of this encounter? One wonders. We can at least be certain that before their divorce, they enjoyed a long and intimate association. It appears that we may intelligently argue that both comedy and satyr play manifest tragedy at play, but on very different levels. The Dionysism of Aristophanic comedy moved forward and became more complex as the 5th century poets developed the parabasis. Satyrs grew increasingly human in appearance and their range of occupations began to include the kind of cultural symbols, the pastimes with which the Greek dramatist like to confront fire, sports, musical instruments, tools and machines etc. in order to rediscover through the satyrs the thrill of that originary impulse that first separated culture from nature. They innovated ever new choruses bringing about changes on the ancient theoriomorphic inheritance. Dionysus and Dionysism of Aristophanes feels much more removed from the ritual pre-political roots seen in satyr plays or Bacchae of Euripides. The choruses of Aristophanes can never be taken at face value. They very explicitly combine layers of costume and disguise at human and animal level. By contrast, the chorus of satyr drama appears to be a constant. Satyrs who are just that and little more. Satyr play of Aristophanes, the fullness of gifts is an example of the exception in Aristophanes to the apparent rule that old comedy did not engage the satyr play as a genre, text or performance. Thus, the boundary between comedy and satyr play emerges clearly. Satyr play is tragedy at play in a mysterious, constitutional, even genetic way. Satyr drama plays by going before and outside the palace. Aristophanes engages tragedy directly 
which may have been inspired by a satyr play. Comedy assimilated its political function ever more closely to that of tragedy to the point of competing with it as it were. Only when he allowed the character Trigaios to soar far above Athens to the prehistoric territory of Olympus, only when his chorus was explicitly identified as an extra political or pan political community, only at this remarkable moment when the chorus was intent on reenacting the invention, discovery and extraction of blessings from the earth in the form of the goddess Irene as the true Pandora, only then did Aristophanes agree that satyrs are good to represent. Thank you.